Again, thanks for taking the time to chat. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? My name is Andre Librov. I'm a CG and VFX artist based in UK, and I'm also a co-owner and co-founder of a company called Out of Nothing, specializing in film production and visual effects. That's awesome. And I was curious about this, like I usually ask all my guests this, but I, did you always want to be an artist growing up? And I always ask that because I'm always fascinated by the answers. It's never, yes, I was, it was always something kind of interesting. But for you, like, did you always picture doing something creative um, when you were growing up? Or was this something that you kind of discovered later on? Well, not really. As a child, the only creative things I've done were Lego. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was growing thinking I'll be either a lawyer or architect, okay. which is sort of creative, but I never thought I'll be where I am now. Not Nothing planned, it just randomly happened. Cool. And I'm curious, like, why lawyer or architect? Was that something more influenced from your parents or someone around you? Or? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things, you know, when parents are telling you about proper profession. That's right. My, grand, yeah. my grandfather is a captain, mm -hmm. uh, goes to see all these manly things, and <laughs> he never, uh, until his last day, uh, I think he never really understood what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. He thought I need I need to be a seaman. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that's where influence comes from. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because I, I think that a lot of people who aren't in the industry don't really get like why you you the computer all the time. And um, I think it's fun when you finally can get to show that stuff off. But at the same time, I think a lot of people don't understand like the dedication, the amount of work and everything else that you put into it, like what it actually is. And um, yeah, it's I, hopefully these days it's becoming a bit more understood. But I think for a lot of us, like everyone just thinks that we're crazy, you know, being at the computer working late hours. Uh, well, it, it's, it's always funny. There's that thing when someone asks you what you do for a living mm -hmm. and what do you answer? I usually just answer, ah, I'm shooting videos. <laughs> but that's it because because there's no point in trying to explain yeah I'm just yeah <laughs> i'm i've always kind of depending on who it is i've always just said I'm, I'm i'm unemployed if i if it's a stranger just because i um you know figure that way i can kind of just start an even conversation rather than getting too you know into anything but um other times yeah i'll say something like i work in film and ho most people will be like okay cool and occasionally you get people who keep asking questions. So I guess I'm learning this about myself that I, I kind of am trying to deter people from asking all, all the, the big things. But yeah, I mean, it's such a, a big conversation and for a lot of people, they don't really get it. So you, but then occasionally you'll meet, like I had a waiter and he um, he heard my wife talking about Maya. And then he's he's, he's like, oh, I use ZBrush. And, and then I said, I, was curious at that point so i was like okay what do you do and it turns out he's like messing with 3d printing and creating all these um really cool kind of maquettes and models and so now i follow him on instagram <laughs> so occasionally you'll meet someone who's um who's super cool and into it and you know you get to nerd out about it uh, where are you originally from originally from latvia but <laughs> we, we were born in ussr so we're russians got it. european kind <laughs> Cool. So when did you move to the UK? I moved in the UK in uh, 2014, mm -hmm. the beginning. And my wife was here since 2008 or even earlier. Right. So, yeah. And I'm just curious, like at the time, was that specifically more of a move to go to like a bigger industry or what was the main reason for moving to, uh, to the UK? So I was freelancing for, since I was 15, I started to freelance uh, in school and I was doing Photoshop and all that kind of stuff at the beginning. And that was my main source of income. Only, it's only 2010 maybe when I started to be interested in 3D. But up until 2014, I was freelancing, doing websites, brochures and all that kind of stuff. But then that stuff in Ukraine happened, right? Mm -hmm. And my, my main clients, they were all from Russia. And I'm in Latvia, which is European Union. So they stopped ordering anything from me because financially it made no sense for them because they could find freelancers in Russia. So I lost any kind of income. 
and I didn't have any job back home. So, and my wife was living, lived here for quite a long time. She said, you should try yourself there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I didn't have uh, English or anything. I just, uh, the only knowledge of English I had was from school. And I came here speaking like true immigrant. <laughs> I, it, I struggled to find my first job because I didn't have any corporate experience, nothing. Right. Nothing, nothing really significant. Just, just couple of fancy images in the showreel. Still, no, 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 no showreel, nothing. And 2012 MacBook. That's it. <laughs> so, I'm curious, like, what kind of places were you targeting at the, at the time? Um, were like, what type of work was it? Still more Photoshop stuff, or what particular? To be honest, at at that, when you're at this kind of level in life. You don't care. I was applying anywhere. I could be a graphic designer, art worker, whatever, something. But at least something somehow related to the industry. But I was like, I got refused a lot. I was looking for a job for almost like seven months or something. And luckily, Natalia's my wife's brother, he was kind enough to uh, provide me a bed, basically feed me for, for that period of That's time great. so i owe him a lot and and i found the first job in southampton in an agency as a motion designer so i was super lucky yeah no i, I love that because I, I think it's so critical to have people around you who are supportive and that's both you know whether it is financially or or having the basics such as a roof over your head but also in addition like having people who support you kind of more emotionally because like if you don't mind talking about like what was it like during those seven months of kind of getting that rejection because again i think a lot of people and I, I know you've got a few videos on this like a lot of people just assume that there's some of us who just kind of like decided one day we're going to do 3d or we're going to do creative work and we just kind of start rocking it out and we never have those tough times or struggle and i think it's really important for a lot of people to realize like yeah all of us go through that that time and it's, it's tricky but the ones who stick with it are the, usually the ones who make it so for you like what was it like in those seven months of like learning english living in the uk but also trying to find your place in in amongst everything so i did mention that i didn't have any showreel and uh, i only had 2012 macbook right mm -hmm. so obviously i spent these seven months just cracking on learning like a maniac I didn't sleep i was just doing and rendering on this little macbook to to have at least something and i think this little something allowed me to get the job but uh, i know exactly what you're talking about and i think it's a hot topic to be honest because in the comments on my youtube videos i see comments like oh my god you're a son of a rich like parents you have all that fancy stuff behind you like gadgets cameras and all that but i sometimes i do reply in comments like i, I started from basically literally nothing like yeah. one mag macbook and just t-shirt and a jeans that's it and uh yeah. i even recorded a video called far away from opportunities showing where i'm from telling my story a little bit that hopefully maybe will inspire someone people saying that they are inspired and i don't know how it is like in 2020 it's totally a different market now it's it's another generation catching up that have different opportunities you know different mindset uh, different technologies around them but yeah, i mean it can't be, new phase too. <laughs> yeah it, it, it can't happen in in a, in a in a moment you know you you need to at least somehow build a strategy plan it a little bit uh, get support from relatives maybe to say like listen i want to do this this thing but it probably will take me like that that long and uh, go from there uh, the jobs it, it's another tricky question it's people are concerned about education mm -hmm. should they go to uni should they try to do it themselves and it's heavily dependent on the person to be honest yeah I, I feel the same way. Older me was very anti-university, but I still felt like, well, for certain personalities, having that consistency or um, the expectation of you to 
accountability, I guess, to show up. Um, you know, it's structured for them. So I think, you know, that and also getting to meet people were two really big benefits. But the way I, I really feel personally is that the real experience, like the real knowledge you'll get is on the job and the people that you're around as totally. well learn from. So the longer you're at school, the longer you're delaying ever really getting started. So, you know, especially these days with so much information free and, uh, you know, paid online, you know, I think that for a lot of us, we can just get going as soon as possible. And once you get your foot in the door, you know, I feel like the first few weeks are going to be worth a few, the first few years, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, the, the, the thing, my problem with the education, especially when it comes to any sort of graphics, even web design or whatever, it's really clumsy, if you know what I mean. Technology <laughs> evolves like crazy fast, crazy fast. And education, it's like the government. It, uh, yeah, it, it can't keep up. My, my business partner tells me, oh, look at look at that guy. He just graduated. I don't bloody care because <laughs> Let he let let his show will speak for him. Exactly. It doesn't mean necessary that these are bad artists, but it's just I think it's time not the most efficiently spent. People like yourself and uh, other amazing true artists from a true industry. If you want that practical real knowledge, just go and grab it. It's free. I gave a speech on Andrew Kramer's Video Copilot Europe tour couple of years ago right. that was my topic to try to inspire people to realize that everything is there for free you just need to type in the questions and get your answers that's right yeah i think in some ways like there's too much information out there and that's kind of like the tricky thing is finding the right you know avenues to go down but you're right like everything's there these days and that's something that i don't think either of us really had you know, getting into any of this. Like, I, I still get jealous that people are learning 3D in high school because, you know, <laughs> it took me years to be able to finally be able to explain to people what I do just because there were, you know, when Toy Story came out, I could finally point and be like, yeah, that kind of stuff. Um, just because no one really knew what that thing was. Um, it is such a critical topic, what you're talking about, like coming from nothing and also you know, people have an expectation that like, you know, everything's handed to you, you know, on a, a silver spoon. There's a, a lot of misconceptions about that. And I think that, you know, a lot of us, it is about, you know, paving the way yourself rather than relying on other people. And the more that you give people permission you, or, or expect people to um, to do everything for you, um, the, the less you're gonna be, you know, tough enough to kind of really make it later on. So for you, you know, what was it like, um, even just building your portfolio as well? Because again, like, as you mentioned, it really comes down to your portfolio, your demo reel, like more than anything. And I see people spending like a year on their reel when, you know, you if you're really desperate, if you're, if you're really focused, you could make a demo reel in a week or two, enough to be able to get that first job. Um, obviously we all go through, you know, the rejection and it's, it's easier said than done with getting a reel that's going to lend you the job, but like um, giving yourself those condensed timelines of, okay, two weeks to make my first reel, and then at least I can put it out there, see what happens and tweak it if I need to from there. Like, what are your thoughts on, um, you know, the key essentials to like really making it and, and getting out there? And like, what advice would you give to people who are, you know, trying to uh, get their first job? The reel, as it stands, it, uh, everyone wants it fancy, yeah, but if you are desperate to land a job, it's not only that video file, all right? And especially you have an interview where you meet face to face to your whatever future line manager or whoever. You can present it, it can be steals, it, it, it can be breakdowns, it can be your process explanation, because whatever you do, you're in 3D, it's complicated already just present yeah. explain that you understand the topic you know how to deliver if there are shots that are not fully rendered explain why because he here's the thing like photography web design those are cheap kind of industries Ch cheap in terms of your expenses yeah. for them right vfx and, and cinematography is the most expensive industry in the world 
you know, you, you, you can, there is no limit how much you can spend on the gear, cameras, everything is the most expensive. So when you're starting out and you're referencing like the top agencies as your level for the real, it's not going to happen. These guys, they have like millions invested in, in machines that are rendering or it's rendered on render farms, whatever. So be clever and uh, a presentation is the, the most important thing. That That's what I did. So I, I sat down with that MacBook. I rendered like a reel that is something like 40 seconds, like some short pieces, no, no, no meaning behind them. Just the, just the, the shots where something is animated. And then I had a lot of stills from my photography background with some 3D on top. And I explained like, well, listen, I can do that type of uh, stuff, that type of content. We can do this here, that, using that, that, that. And they were like, hey, yeah, that that can really expand our service list, which was cool. I like that. That's kind of cool. Because again, I think that for live action, it's really important to be able, be able to demonstrate that you can integrate live action and CG together, but also you have a good understanding of the process. And even looking at Photoshop still, something like that, like it's context. So I think that um, that's enough to kind of show like this person's got a lot of potential, but also when you are able to go to a studio that maybe you've got some skills that are outside of what they typically offer, then at that point you're adding to the studio, you're, you're contributing additional services. So. I think it's really cool because yeah, if they are doing something kind of different and you come in with a background, let's say in, in VR and you're applying at a film studio, then suddenly for some boutique places that they might be able to start offering VR services or something kind of different. Um, yeah. So that's really cool being able to kind of figure out like what you have that maybe they don't have and be able to lean into that too. It's also a tough thing to choose what exactly you want to do because yeah. C CG, 3D, whatever, it's so broad. It's crazy. I probably will be safe saying it's one of the craziest deep industries as well as expensive one, because you can do so many things. And I think one of my key values as a business asset, if I can say that, mm -hmm. is that I'm really I know everything about everything, literally. I may not be proficient in m most of these things, but I know how they work. So if problem needs to be sorted, it will be sorted somehow. And it's tough yeah. to, a lot of people in comments asking like, hey, hey listen, what, what, what should I do? Should I go for characters or mm -hmm. uh, look dev, whatever, lighting depart departments? And I, I don't know. Because these days, it's there, there. There are no problems being a generalist and being good at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our particular business, only now we start to somehow introduce specialists that are dedicated to some tasks that have some strengths over being a generalist. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, hired a guy who's a really, really strong dude in look dev and lighting, texturing, matte paints, all that kind of stuff. Another dude is really proficient in organic animations like people, keyframe animation, that kind of stuff. And I'm a just generalist. So we have all different sort of sorts of projects from VFX commercials. When you shoot it, you apply the effects on top. We have full CG commercials. Then we have live events that needs a lot of technical planning from screens being built in arenas and all that kind of stuff, how the content will get split, building scripts in Fusion or Nuke that will divide the content into screens, all these logics. So yeah, it's, it's tough to choose what you wanna be. Yeah, I think that's the really tricky thing because I think everyone is kind of like, you know, where do I begin? And, and it's so easy to get overwhelmed. Me personally, I feel like everyone should start as a generalist, but I do think at some point you need to start to specialize even if it is just more your messaging as like a personal brand to be able to differentiate you from everyone else. But how important do you think it is for any artist to still learn and obsess about all the other areas? So as you mentioned, being more of a generalist, but you know everything, um, how important do you think it is for others to at least have some understanding of 
all the different departments and what they do and how things work. Because even if I'm in, you know, a character animator, I think understanding some rigging, some modeling, it's going to help me at least be able to problem solve or communicate problems that I have or, or needs that I have to other people in the departments. But also if I understand lighting and, and everything else, it's, it's still strengths that I need to, to know at least a little bit. Um, yeah, but, and then other areas like effects or compositing, knowing lighting, shading, a little bit of scripting, all these other things, it just helps kind of build up your, your strengths overall. Yeah, I think it's inevitable being a narrow focused professional for some periods of time. And you can't become a generalist like, hey, okay, I'll be a generalist. Generalist is exactly person, it's a director. It's mm -hmm. a person who knows everything about anything and if necessary he can pick up that work and for example in my reel in my works um, i have like rigged robots that i've built from scratch but that was the only time i did it i never done any robots since then i was just curious about that particular topic like hard surface modeling and rigging for robots i learned that that's gone same with cars same with environments, uh, macro shots of some textures and all that kind of stuff. I may not even be doing it for the rest of my life, but I've done it once. And I was, at that moment, I was like lighting and texture, uh, texturing artist. I painted all the textures That's cool. and things like that. So yeah, you just have to, I know it's, it, it's tough in the beginning because it's like, you don't know where to start. I do get the struggle. We all have, we, we've all, all been there. And yeah. I think it's just time. It's just time. Just keep rolling. Keep keep grinding the knowledge from wherever you're grinding it. And mm -hmm. yeah. How I learned to do scripting and a lot of coding was in Maya with Mel, you you, you basically need to, to know a lot of that. But um, in the beginning learning scripting it's kind of like you could be learning so much it's very overwhelming like if you just say okay today i want to learn scripting it's kind of like where do you begin and that's the closest thing i can relate to people starting out now is like picking a topic so broad but if you set a goal and this is how like one of my buddies of where to explain scripting to me back then was like if you set a goal of i want to make a tool that just tells me what lights and shadows turned on something as simple as that that gives you some direction because I think most people get so overwhelmed with where to begin that they never start. But if you're able to say, okay, well, I want to make a robot and I want to make it move or whatever else, then at least you're giving yourself some kind of direction that you can then start to break it down into, yeah, okay, exactly. well, yeah, what do I need to do to do that? I need to learn how to modeling, texturing, um, lighting, rigging, you know, let me go and do all these things. But if you're just uh, going to say, I'm going to do 3D, it's just, you know it's it's going to be a little bit too overwhelming to know where to begin well in which case i would say if it does seem overwhelming just don't stop it's 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 not that bad and uh, over time everything will start to make sense yeah and the layout will start to build out in your head because in the beginning you don't know even closely what stages are there what stages are involved what you need to do to do that and then the only way is, as, as I mentioned, yeah, break it down, focus on one topic. When you do it in the process, mm -hmm. correct questions start to pop up in the head. Exactly. Uh, yeah. and, and in Google, you just type in that exact mm -hmm. narrow focused question, Google answers, that's it. One of my team just messaged me a, a few minutes before the call and um, he's like, hey, I, I'm trying to do this cost simulation, attach it to splines, everything. and." I'm running this issue with it and you know first thing I said is well I don't take this the wrong way but have you googled it yet and he's like oh yeah <laughs> duh <laughs> and of course like you know half the, the problems we run into like there's someone's already ran into that and documented it so exactly yeah it's actually surprises me how many people even in day-to-day -day life they still kind of what's the word they ignore Google yeah like Crazy. Even young generation, like my 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 wife has a, a nie niece who's um, well, she's twenty now. She still like asks us instead of googling right. simple things. 
yeah I, I don't know i guess it's a mindset and for for me and you we probably grew in that generation with the internet so we were so excited about it and like oh come on information it's right. so easy that we use it we now appreciate it and it's um, part of our day-to-day life but the newer generation there not all of them are like that which is interesting yeah it, it is pretty fascinating just to kind of think of what people are um are like growing up with this like i started watching this netflix documentary just came out yesterday um i can't remember the name of it but you know they were mentioning how a lot of people are now being born into social media and like what that's like for their brain but i think in general you know it's very different whether it is our industry or whether it's technology you know i I find it kind of fascinating because like for me i'm you know i can still think back to you know having data on cassette tapes or you know your computer was the keyboard um you know just when the internet came around you know all those things but for other people you know i I hang out with my friend's daughter she's two years old she's like swiping my laptop trying to unlock it like an ipad you know and you're trying to explain to her that it's not an ipad but that's it like they're kind of born into all this technology it's just kind of second nature to them and whether they appreciate it or whether it's it becomes more intuitive for them. It's it's pretty fascinating just to kind of think like, you know, different generations and how they interpret, you know, everything that we do day to day. Yeah, that's what I meant earlier as well. The, well, not the youngsters already, but they are catching up, getting jobs and all that. They're like 20 years old guys having absolutely different background, absolutely different opportunities, technologies. And uh, I just ran a challenge uh, automotive CG challenge where people submit their work and they get a prize sponsored by NVIDIA. But dude, there were 13 years old participants that were doing crazy stuff. One more time, 13 years old. He's doing bloody CG already. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. <laughs> so, yeah. I've always felt that way um, because I always refer to it that way too. It's like I look in CG talk and you got kids who are 13, 15 doing phenomenal work. And I think these days the tools have become so easy that, you know, people can just pick it up. And like, that's why I love about ZBrush is like, it's one of those tools that is intuitive enough that there isn't this gap between the technology and the artist. The artist can just sit down and start doing or creating. Yeah. And I love that. Um, yeah, like for you, like, what have been some of those areas that you've been really blown away with you know what people are able to do or or what kind of technology is coming out whether it is like even older technology that's you know that you've seen just when like i said when zbrush came out how it changed everything after that macbook experience when i started i was like if we're playing games and games are associated with graphic cards there definitely should be a way to render using graphic cards and octane they were pioneers and that stuff yeah and when 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 i started to use that that was like mind-blowing and that's when i when i got into hardware side of things i started to because i couldn't afford buying pre-built machines from suppliers i started to dig the topic how i build my own so i started to save money invest into more cards building machines that that's what I mean about the broad everything right. in this industry. Who have who who could have thought <laughs> I would be building machines? And now, like five years ago, I needed those. I had a fancy station with four 1080 Ti cards, right? Mm-hmm. And now they've released a card that basic two cards are faster than my whole system five five years ago. It's crazy. Yeah, I look at like the iPhone, like. Uh, Actually, a good example is I get messages from people saying, I want to do what you do, but I don't have a good computer. And I think if like the specs of an iPhone is like, you know, pretty freaking powerful these days. I mean, I kind of feel like you've, you've got no excuse these days because I, I started out in like a 286 with one megabyte of RAM. And, um, you know, what do you got on like my Pixel, I think is like is four or eight gigs of RAM. I think it's eight, but the iPhones are typically four gigs, something like that. But um, yeah, it's just these days, like you can do anything on a computer. And if anything, I think having less computer power actually trains you to be more efficient rather than like all the computer power and getting kind of 
lazy about it all. It, it forces you to say, okay, well, how do I break it up into multiple render passes? So I could do foreground and background separately because it's too much to render or whatever it, it is to allow you to get it done. It's going to help you get better and more proficient at what you're doing. Yeah. Well, the, the CG challenge, challenge, again, it's uh, the reason I'm running it every year. I'm mm -hmm. looking for sponsors for a good, expensive prize and all that. It's not for the prize as such. It's, I hope to show people themselves in this particular situation, how you approach it. Like th this is a problem to solve. You need to deliver whatever the task was within a month with the resources that you have. And then people in comments, they, some of them start to moan like, hey, come on, <laughs> I don't have a powerful machine. And then on the review date, when I'm looking at the jobs, people usually write the stories, how they did it and, and things like that. So some people that got into top 10, for example, they use Blender free. Then mm -hmm. Blender have some sort of free render forms. That's it. That dude just solved the problem. Yes. So yeah, as you said, there, there are no excuses these days. What gave you the, uh, the idea to create the contest and like what what did you kind of discover the first time you did it? So, uh, can you see it from that angle? So there's a jar, right? So usually that jar is with fireflies and it's, it, it's just a random discovery from Ikea. My wife actually thought like it's a stupid idea to put a jar uh, on a background. But then I added those fireflies, it kept rolling. People, it's one of the hottest questions, like what are those? What is that lamp? Where can I get it? And then I revealed the secret, made a tutorial about it, how to make one. And decide, and I was collaborating with Razer. At the moment, I was reviewing one of their laptops and I said, hey, listen, it's a, I have like a hot topic on channel going on with those jars. What do you think about running a contest? And maybe you guys will sponsor one of your laptops. For, for the winner so we did that it was a big success there are usually around 300 submissions which is all right for for my size of channel and uh, yeah that's how it started then i ran another one in the spring which was, there there was no big prize but uh, subscription sort of subscription to my padawan membership <laughs> on youtube and then the last one, automotive one, with, was with another big prize sponsored by NVIDIA. The priority in all of this is knowledge. People will learn because that's exactly what you said. You can't really develop until you get your, uh, until you get on work. That's exactly that. I'm giving those circumstances to people. And I respect those participants that actually come back to me afterwards saying, hey, Andre, thank you. I learned so bloody much over that period and they don't don't care about the price the price is just a nice bonus yeah i love that yeah that's cool that's really cool just to jump around a little bit but like you mentioned your youtube channel and i guess for you like when did you start your channel and at the same time like what was the main goal behind it when you first uh, launched it it was my distraction from work <laughs> because when doing it doesn't matter if you are a business owner or just an artist in the studio work can get i will i will call it depressive mm -hmm. it's usually the same client the same sort of stuff again and again and again and again with the men's with all the fun coming with it because work is work that's probably another thing to realize that something that pays the bills will be the least interesting aspect of your VFX <laughs> artist's life but yeah and I hoped that YouTube would become my distraction where I could post my case studies some thoughts maybe a couple of tutorials and I wanted to try it since 2017 tried only in 2018 I think yeah and yeah it goes I think if I would be full-time YouTuber it would be much better but you know it i'm not doing it for money when mm -hmm. when we're talking about youtube it's just for, for fun yeah and 
I guess like when you launched it and just kind of going through that path, like what was it like? Like were there any big realizations you learned along the way or any big benefits? Like I I think in a way you're building community, you're getting to share and give back. I mean, there's so many advantages to it, but what's your experience been like building a successful YouTube channel? Well, at first you appreciate all the positive comments you get. It's uh, amazing energy coming from it. It's really, it's better than antidepressant, depressants, what's the word? Yeah. Seriously, it's as good as this. It keeps you motivated, it keeps you moving. Then I started to have some haters, <laughs> people who constantly put dislikes on me or don't like my teeth or saying like that, but basically classic trolls. Those are not artists or professionals. They're, yeah. they're just there to troll you. Uh, there, there was period when YouTube started to take a lot of my time. Mm -hmm. So I, I obviously have work to do and uh, I was trying to upload every week. And that was destructive little period because <laughs> it's yeah. impossible. I started to fail on both fronts. So now I'm just doing YouTube whenever I can. Really, I'm not stressing about it. I'm not trying to push it anywhere. I do want million subscribers, but it's 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 just like a background desire. It's nothing mm. like my goal or anything. YouTube is just there. And in terms of wor actual work, uh, I actually had a couple of client, business clients. Uh, and it was easier for me to establish a relationship with them just because they knew me from YouTube. They knew that I know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But that's probably one off uh, situation there. Well, I, I think in general, like it, it definitely has its benefits, like not just YouTube, but you know, again, this kind of goes more into the, the topic of personal brand, which, you know, th there's many different ways to interpret that, but really it's reputation and I think well, that, yeah, I'm, I'm talking to you right now. It won't happen without YouTube, obviously. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, like in general, like them, you know, you're building awareness around people, and you get to know about other people, and and that's what I love too. Is that you know, with anyone, whether it's Andrew Kramer or hundred other people that we've mentioned, you know, all of us connect because we all have this passion, so we congregate in these communities, and mm -hmm. through reputation, you end up putting attention on certain people and because of that you know um it it helps because that way you see someone doing really cool work or fireflies in a jar and you know whatever it might be and um but you become aware of certain people and and that's you know because of their brand um and i think it's really great because you know then you get to follow their work and, and everything else but even from a professional stance you know getting to see and being aware of certain people and that like Raf Grizzetti is a good example of like, wow, that guy does really cool ZBrush work or Ashthorpe for motion graphics, you know, bit by bit, you become aware of certain people and, and that reputation builds with you. So when it comes to hiring people, there are certain people that are going to come to, to mind like, oh, we got to get that person because they did this really cool thing. And even when it comes to like car contests or whatever, like that in a way is um, a chance where someone might see someone's work in there and say cool we need a photo real car and they go to the contest and start contacting totally. people in there. so you know in, in a way like um the putting your, your work out there in whichever way that you do it's a chance for other people to see it and become aware of you and then that can always lead to work and i think that's always been a really critical aspect some people kind of stay offline and um you know, maybe it is because they, they don't want the, the one or two random haters or whatever it might be, but they miss out on a lot of opportunities that otherwise um, could have been real cool um, for them. So I do think in general, like it's it's such a crazy internet and you're right, like having, whether it's YouTube or Instagram, like there's so many platforms these days that you can show off all your work. Um, for you, like what have been some of the, the things that you kind of really get to experience like for me for me like there's certain 
artist on Instagram, for instance, that you end up following, it just becomes like a really cool way to get inspired. It's just to, to have certain accounts that you're constantly looking at and seeing all this really cool stuff that might even be completely out of the realm of what you do, but it still inspires you as an artist. So I think there's so many benefits to that. To that. Yeah, well, actually, I think I raised that question in one of my older videos, it's a psychological aspect of that. If you would go to my Instagram, you would see that I'm not following that many mm -hmm. people. And it's just, you have to be careful with that stuff because it may become overwhelming and it may, it, it can demotivate you. And when people, I had those comments because all the, all, most of my com content is inspired by comments, what people are interested in. And people were writing like, is there a point to become a 3D artist in, in whatever, 2018? Uh, there are so many out there already. And, and I said that thing that it's your point of interest. You subscribing to those people, you're following Behance pages, you're watching showreels, whatever, uh, participating in groups on Facebook. So you, you created your own VFX bubble the effects interest bubble and you have that illusion that everyone is bloody the effects artist now yeah. but it's far 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 away from reality there is a high demand for 3d artists the effects artists cinematographers well maybe less for cinematographers because it's more approachable kind of profession mm -hmm. but but still and there are lawyers, there are doctors, the whole world is doing everything apart from VFX. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's a good point. But I also think it comes down to like whether, I think there's different types of people or different mindsets, I guess, that you need to be... Uh, no, no, I think I think you just need to balance out, not spend all your time like watching the right. you know, content and scrolling through Instagram, trying to get inspired if something inspires you will find you yeah i think that's actually a good topic too is just in relation to that because you're right like i don't tend to scroll too much so it's it's usually if it lands on the, the first post that then i'll see it so i don't get to see too much but occasionally i see something i'm like oh that's really cool but then there's things like facebook which i managed to find like a, a google chrome extension that blocks the facebook feed and so i hear all these horrific stories of people like you know, they jump on their feed and they see like animals being tortured because someone shared it or, or things like that. And for me, like whenever I go onto Facebook, it just comes up with like a quote from Lincoln or whoever, and there's no Facebook wall. So either I'm going there intentionally to message someone or I go on there and it's completely blank. Yeah. So having that extension kind of, you know, protects me from being distracted or demotivated by negative stuff. So that's actually a good, really, really, really good point. It's mm -hmm. something to consider consider excluding all distracting factors from your life, like uh, get rid of TV, get rid of news, don't participate in any political debates or even thinking about it, because that's distracting thing. I actually got rid of political thoughts in my yeah. life. Seriously, I was big on like discuss something about some countries uh, it was destructive for myself i got rid of it I'm not wasting any energy on that there is no point throw that energy elsewhere yeah no that's good advice because you're right like i think that um it's good to surround yourself with things that are positive they're going to pull you up but it's also worth paying attention to the things that are negative uh, negatively affect you even people around you too because as you mentioned i think your brother-in-law like having people that support you and, uh, and and also emotionally support you but let's say you you have friends that maybe tell you to like you know give up on art because it's a waste of time or they're always distracting you you know to go do things that are, aren't too beneficial to you it's sometimes important to kind of separate yourself from that if you're really focused on the big goals you want to do and you got people telling you to you know to kind of settle then sometimes it's better to find the people who are going to get behind you I think it will be gone over maybe generation, but yeah, it's still there. People saying like, don't do that. And in the beginning, like I'm advising to people, if 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 that's the case, you can't feed feed yourself. Like you have to 
find the job that will feed you, keep developing in the evenings. Like mm-hmm. hustle. You have to hustle. Yeah, absolutely. So just to jump around a little bit, um, I was curious, like actually one thing that you mentioned before, which I think is really valuable too, is just um, you mentioned with directors, like knowing everything. And that's how I kind of see things too, is it's kind of like an hourglass where I think starting as a generalist, you begin to specialize over time. But I always find that later on you start to branch out again, because as you begin to supervise or whether you want to manage, you know, bigger teams, like you need to have that 30,000 foot view of how everything operates. And I think that that's really good what you mentioned, because to move into directing or something, maybe you have that niche that helped you kind of stand out and get there, but you need to have an understanding of what everyone does. Otherwise, you can't utilize everyone um, in doing what you need to get done. You, you can't even evaluate the time necessary for particular task completion. Yeah, totally. When it came time to, to launch your own company, uh, whether it is just realizing the, the workload involved or how to get clients or what experiences did you, did you have? It's an interesting question. Uh, the thing is that in 2020, I'm not entirely convinced that company is necessary for artists, especially because, again, in the comments or emails, people send, they, hey, I just launched the studio, or hey, I want to launch a studio. Mm-hmm. Why do I, why exactly do you need that for? Um, and in my case, so I was sitting in my company that I got my first job in, and, uh, you know, finance evolution happened slowly in there, but then suddenly I had an offer from NVIDIA. Mm-hmm. They offered like a good role, good money, but I told in my company that, hey, these guys are paying that much. If you kind of appreciate what I do here, you have to do something. So they matched and I stayed there, but then I met my partner, business partner, and I started to freelance for him. He already owned another company by then. And uh, I I was making good money and all that stuff. And then at some point I I realized that my main work kind of dragging me down and it makes no sense. I better dedicate more time for that that side of things. And I did, I I was a contracted supplier for my business partner. I was kind of individual and that that was working fine but then we decided like listen maybe we should merge our competencies if that makes Mm -hmm. sense and and build something bigger which we did and uh, here we go we 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 we're growing and yeah who knows where 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 it may go from here but as an for, for artists individually uh, my say would be, well, A, you always need that business partner because as an artist, you can't do any of that bureaucracy, running a company, taxes, mm-hmm. like bookkeeping. That's something you will not, you will fail. Just trust me because <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> it's, it, it's a tedious process that needs 100% concentration. It yeah. has to be sorted by someone else. So you can't do that already. So you have to decide either you're a businessman or you're an artist. For me personally, I'm an artist and not a businessman. So I'm just lucky to have these people around me who, who are businessmen. I found that's always been the best kind of partnership where you have, let's say a producer and an artist, because yeah. you essentially got someone who is really grounded in, in the business side, but they need that creative because the creative person is really the product. They're the one offering the service, but totally. at the same time, like that creative, at least like, cause I've always been, been obsessed with seeing how studios run and, and different um, benefits and which ones work, which ones don't. And I've always found that that's always the best partnership is one with the business and one with the art because the artist is always going to say, we can do all this. It's going to be amazing. And having that other person, the realist who's like, well, this is what's in the budget. It's kind of keeping them a bit more grounded, but the two are kind of symbiotic in the sense that it means that one person can 
want to recreate the world and do all these amazing things, but you're you know, just describing ways, myself. <laughs> but that's just it, like that, because for me, I always think back to frantic films like Chris Bond and Ken Zorniak. Um, Ken was the producer and Chris was the creative. And but that's just it, like since then, I've seen it so many times over. And, and as you mentioned, like, I think it's important because maybe if the creative is always, you know, like nothing's ever finished, it, it's there's more, you know, I can do to it or doing too much that it is never kind of sees the light of day having someone with the schedule and the spreadsheet, you know, the two together kind of make things work really well. So I think that, yeah, finding that person who maybe is um, kind of fills in the gaps with the areas that you're not as passionate about, it means that they might be really passionate about the business side or whatever it might be. And the two of you together, kind of like an artist and a programmer or whatever combination, it means that together you're unstoppable, but by yourselves, you've got all this talent in different areas, but when you kind of interlink, then the sky's the limit. Yeah, that, 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 that's the only way of building the company because I am exactly that dude that you described. Oh yeah, we can do bloody everything. And then you're <laughs> spending weeks on one shot and you have 40 more to do. Oh yeah, I've been there. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it sometimes. <laughs> like perfectionism kills me. It's interesting what you said, because I, I feel like I've got a different view on creative versus business. I, I feel like I'm an artist, but I also respect business and coding and all these other things that I don't necessarily self identify with, but I've interest in those. But that's one thing too, that um, a lot of the time I, I do kind of wear the producer hat when it comes to schedules and budget, because like I'll always look at what can be done more on what can be done in the time frame that we have. And well, I, I'm doing I'm doing that as well, but that's right. just uh, senior artists kind of responsibility. It's fine. It's not right. completely business. No, you're right, because it's, it's essentially the thirty thousand foot view or being in the trenches. Because one's doing, but the other one is operating. You know, you, you got to have someone needs to have the foresight to see where the project's going. Uh, whereas yeah. a lot of more junior or mid level artists, they're like, you know, give me something to animate. I'm ready. But you gotta have someone yeah, yeah, yeah. looking at, well, you're animating, you're modeling, you're doing all this, like how do we actually make a finished piece? So I think it's really important to um, to have that foresight into what you're doing. But at the same time, like I think all of us, you know, we would spend weeks on a piece to make it the best thing ever and never let it go. But I'll always look at, well, what's the budget and, and the schedule reflect? Because that ultimately means that at some point we do need to let it go or else we don't become profitable. But for you, how do you kind of deal with um, that level of perfectionism where you want everything to be great, but you also need to, to understand, you know, it is a business and um, either the clients are going to need to grab it at one point or you can't keep paying for everyone to be working on something forever. Well, it's uh, usually my business partner. He says like, oh, listen, you can, you can stop seriously. The client will be happy. You're a good cop and he's bad cop. <laughs> yeah, so, so sort of, yeah. But he's like a restraining part of the team, which is good. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting better at perfectionism because it's better to get it done, better done than none. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it, it, it applies to personal pieces as well. Just do it and move on. Because perfectionism, well, A, it can spoil the work. Most likely it will, because when you like something, there's a good chance if you will keep like trying to improve it, you can spoil it. You just mess with the lighting and something will start to look weird. Mm -hmm. So it's better let it go. When you're happy, when you feel like, oh, that's cool, let it go, it's fine. Before you start working backwards. Yeah, and in business, it's, I mean, you have schedules, yeah. If you don't fit within the schedule, you get spanked. What about personal work? Like, how do you find time? Because again, I think that's one of those excuses that everyone's going to have is like, I want to do this, but I don't have the time. And you've got family, you know, you've got a company, you know, I, I feel like you're in a good place to be able to discuss this a little bit, knowing that you don't have much time, but you know, how do you make time to be able to do personal work and the things that you care about? Uh, social media stuff or news or how you prefer to spend your time. Don't sit on Instagram 
even at work, for example, I'm doing a massive simulation in Houdini, right? I'll put it on cache, it's two hours. Uh, I'm lucky to have multiple stations I'm personally working on. So when this, this one is occupied, I'm jumping on another one and doing something. I'm about to build a station back at home where I'll be doing case studies purely on Octane. Cool. And uh, I'll be connecting here and doing something when, whenever I'm rendering something at work or, you know, just downtimes. Plus, I highly recommend waking up at 5 a.m. instead of sitting at nights. But I'm a total loser. I'm going to sleep like uh, midnight and then waking up at 5. And usually I'm so like, Ooh. that's probably why I'm so chilled. It's just because I'm... I'm always sleepy. <laughs> I like it. No, I, I, I get kind of a hard time because um, the wife always, I know I keep mentioning her, but she'll work till three in the morning, whereas like 4.45 a.m. Um, that way I've got 15 minutes to kind of like get up and get into a rhythm. But getting up in the morning, especially when no one else is awake, it's it's you time. Like no one- Oh mate, it will, um, it will amaze anyone. Seriously, you're waking up at five just quickly brush your teeth, do the exercise, whatever. Jump to work and before the work day starts, yeah. half of your working day is already finished and you won't believe how productive you are in the morning. That's it's right. crazy. You're just blasting through it. And then the rest of the day, seriously, you can be so chilled. You will be able to find time for your personal stuff for yeah. anything. I, I also feel like it's quality time too because I feel like most people when they're doing overtime, like at a studio, everyone's kind of messing around and having fun. And they're not, you know, and, and it's also kind of hard to maintain a life if you're going home at midnight every night. But if you're getting up early and, and getting to work, then by the time everyone else is coming in, those like, let's say four hours or five hours, that is the equivalent of an entire day because it's exactly. like quality time. So and no one distracts you, which is super important because yeah. once someone so concentration, I heard uh, uh, what what it's considered a psychological fact. If you get distracted, mm -hmm. you you need 27 minutes to get back in focus. That's right. So during the working day, when every producer will come to you asking a question, it's, it's focus lost. So in the morning, you're in the studio, you're alone. You're just those four hours or whatever. You just sit there super focused. It, it's 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 a must i guess actually that's a really good point that we kind of hinted at at the very beginning which was i'm kind of interested to see where the the industry is going now because as you mentioned with um younger people they've got their own challenges compared to what we might have had earlier on but i think that we're kind of going through a bit of a different phase now with covid and everything happening that um a lot of us are working from home whether it's temporarily or permanent but I think that that's pretty fascinating, despite all the, the bad stuff that's going on. I think that it's kind of interesting now that it's kind of proven that we can work from anywhere. And because of that, not only does it mean that you don't necessarily need to be physically at a studio, but also you don't need to physically be located in an expensive city necessarily either. So I think there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of really interesting shifts happening. Like what's your take on all this? Yeah, it makes so much sense. Like I personally, even though I need to like brief people and all that stuff in the studio, I work half of the time from home now. And uh, what we noticed over the lockdown period is that performance of the team actually increased. And it's, it makes so much sense, seriously. People don't need to spend money on commuting to work, parking, lunches, whatever all that stuff so it's financial savings for people so people are more happy than uh, commuting time probably in LA it's insane but even in UK like commute to another city for, to work is a normal thing here so that's a couple of hours of your day gone for commuting yeah. it's terrible and people can spend it with the loved ones they will be in general more happy more rested and as a result, more responsible, I believe, because seriously, we've seen an increase in performance and if everyone's happy, we're happy. Yeah, I love that. And 
for you personally, have you seen it at your studio um, things kind of working really efficiently, or like how do you typically communicate with everyone? We have catch ups every day at nine. Uh, it doesn't matter if people are in studio or off studio. We're just running those calls, and those that are working from home joining, running through schedule, just clarifying what we're all doing throughout the day, and. Uh, that's it we're not really checking on people if they're really working or not You're, you know we're not sp spying on them we're t we trust them and yeah everything is delivered so as long as the product doesn't suffer it's fine do whatever you want how you how you want it and for cg team in particular i've established i'm really proud of of what i've established in terms of gear so we have physical stations with the server in the studio and the guys are connecting either from their home stations or we provide laptops. That's what I'm doing. I don't have any stations here for myself yet, but I will build one. I'm working on a MacBook, I'm connecting to multiple machines, like be be beastie, beefy machines from the laptop. It works fine. I can work on a sofa. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a good point too, because when you mentioned having a 2012 MacBook Pro, the only Mac I've ever owned it was a 2012 MacBook Pro, and um, mm -hmm. that was something I found kind of interesting. Is like, whenever I wasn't in LA, all my render farm still was, and there was a one time where I did seven feature films simultaneously um, from my MacBook Pro running 3ds Max, uh, just remoting into my machines in LA, and. As long as you have a fast internet connection, like where you are and what computer you have doesn't really matter so much because you're tapping into all the hardware remotely somewhere else in the world. And it meant that you can just keep firing out sims, firing out renders and, and alternating, which you know is amazing. Yeah. And these days, to be honest, even the internet speed, speed is not that critical as long as it's not like color critical work, like grading or something like that. It's fine to connect from anything. And it's it's and that's the future right here yeah absolutely um and it's, again like i think that um with everyone working from home that's kind of like again proven another point that you know most major studios like industrial light and magic is a good example they they had already tested out setting up an la location kind of secretly back in like 2015 i think 2014 and so they already had tested out like you know, everyone in LA had a keyboard and a mouse and a screen. They didn't have computers. They're all physically in San Francisco. So that already proved to them that you could be in another location and, and have all the computers, you know, on the network doing their thing. And it meant that when COVID hit, everyone just got, you know, a computer sent home to them and they just, you know, tap into the network and PCOIP and do their thing. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, it even sp speeds up the production itself. I remember that project in December. So it was in, uh, in studio in London. It's a blue screen massive studio, right? And I took my razor with me and I was remoting to my big stations, which had backdrops that will be applied to that blue screen footage. And we were just using it as a timeline to know what actors need to do. It's so cool. It's, it's just a small little laptop. That's all you need. Right. Cameras cool. are get cameras are getting crazy good. Like those remoting stuff, everything like real time is moving in the in interesting direction. Virtual production. I mean, there's so much things to be excited about. Just kind of tapping into that topic of you know there being so much stuff out there. Like for you, like what do you think is some of the big technical trends that you're following right now. Obviously, GPU, you mentioned Redshift as, as one example um, that you're digging into at the moment. Like, I think real time, you know, the sky's the limit there with what you can do. But like for you, like, what are some of the things that you've been looking to virtual production or whatever it might be? Well, virtual production as such requires a lot of investments. Yeah, uh, we, we did consider it. But uh, for the size of our business, we can't really afford it yet. But I believe, like I'm almost 100% sure that that's the future. It can't be otherwise. It will be something like Unreal Engine and those domes behind you. 
you're you're exclu- is excluding so many so many production steps it mm. reduces costs of production and then uh, don't go in that i can talk about this <laughs> like for for a whole night and uh, john favreau he's a massive huge inspiration for me just his career path uh, as well as james cameron those are pioneers in those revolu- revolutionary technologies blows my mind mandalorian mm-hmm. that's the future yeah. it's inevitable it will be like that even even companies like auto if you would look at it right there is octane and then they they they're developing the new kernel called bright brigada i don't know how to pronounce it in english but it's basically real time thing and when implemented within Unreal Engine, so you can have preview and power of Unreal Engine. And then for final output, you will just switch the kernel to Octane or Brigade, whatever, <laughs> and render the production quality shots. And uh, yeah, I, I think that right now, like if anyone's looking to make bank, like that's kind of the area because there's only a few like less than a dozen places on the planet that are really truly doing virtual production right and so because of that it's it's one of those things that's going to take over the planet and the people who get in there early are definitely going to you know got to pave the way there but, that's what uh, i'm saying to my partner come on let's do that well save the sound bite and, and fire it out and see say there's a few <laughs> other people backing up your statement but yeah i mean um yeah there, there's a few key studios doing um a lot of the stuff and especially now where it's not so safe in California to shoot anything um, with a lot of talent together in one place it means that we need to you know sometimes look at doing safer uh, sound stages and things like that where instead of going in and taking lots of people out to certain locations you might be able to shoot everything in a, a controlled environment with virtual production so not only is it long term going to help with budgets but it's also going to be safer there's so many different benefits to it and yeah i think that right now it's just it's starting that peak but it's going to completely revolutionize like what we're doing even three absolutely years. mate i i really love that concept of production stages merging together mm-hmm. a good example like unreal engine where it has like 3d aspect it has comp in there and it has color grading in the same place. Yeah. Same with virtual production in the real world. You're just eliminating like the need for really tedious processes. And you can combine virtual production with practical effects. And you basically have your final shot right away. Crazy. I'm really excited. It's going to be cool. Yeah. Well, maybe we can uh, chat a bit more about that next time around. But um, this has been a lot of fun. Like, Where can people go to find out more about you? So youtube.com slash Andre Librov, Instagram, the same Andre Librov. Uh, yeah, subscribers, welcome. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll make sure to link to everything in the show notes, but this has been a lot of fun, man. Thank you. Absolutely, my total pleasure uh, to meet you and talk to you. And it's a uh, total pleasure to speak to the person who understands what, <laughs> what I'm talking about, because, you know, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome.